Today, we are sprinting through the Bible. Okay, we are sprinting through the Bible. It reminds me of uh, <laughs> season one of, uh, of The Office with Michael Scott. Okay, anyway, you had to have watched The Office for that. But I, I, I started thinking about a month or two ago, you know what, it would be really cool if we preached the whole Bible on one Sunday and we just sprinted through the Bible. You know what, let's do it on Super Bowl Sunday. That'll be really cool. And at the time, I told Tristan and I told Annie, I told my wife Sarah, and I was sharing it with a few people and it was like, hey, this is going to be cool, this is going to be a good idea, blah, blah, blah. And then, about a week ago, I picked up the subject again and I was like, hey, you know what, I, I think I should actually get prepared for this, right? And so I'm starting to get prepared and, and come to find out, um, it, it kind of hit me. I was like, um, oh man, this is going to be difficult, okay? Because I don't know if you know this or not, but there's over, there, or there's 66 books in the Bible with over 40 authors in three different languages written over 1,500 years with over 1,100 chapters, over 31,000 verses, and over 800,000 words in the Bible. And your boy got scared. I was like, yo, there is no way I'm going to be able to preach through the entire Bible. And so then I started doing a little bit of math, okay? I started, I was like a whiz kid, started doing a little bit of math. And I said, okay, I got 35 minutes to preach through the whole Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. Quick math in my head real quick. That gives me about 30 seconds per book of the Bible. And I have literally already wasted two minutes of my time telling you about my struggle, okay? So it, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. It, it's been a little bit uh, overwhelming. And, and, you know, the first two minutes of this sermon, wasting a little bit of time, but... Uh, you know, speaking of that, actually, have you ever felt like you were wasting time? Have you ever felt like you were just like in a cycle and you were just spinning out of control and you like were wasting time and, you know, maybe it's scrolling through Facebook, maybe it's the three hours at night on TikTok, come on somebody and my wife and uh, you just feel like you're wasting time. In fact, some of us, it's like every time you think you're getting ahead... Something comes in and pushes you back. <laughs> like you finally get that job that you really wanted only to realize that, man, that's going to come with a workload that I didn't expect. And I don't know that I actually love this job anymore. Some of us, like you, you finally get that relationship that you wanted for so long. You got the boyfriend or the girlfriend again only to get broken up with again, you know. And, and you find yourself, and I found, found myself before in literally just a cycle of going through the motions where it feels like time is being wasted. We've all been there, every single one of us. In fact, this idea of a cycle is honestly what I believe the entire Old Testament, we're going to talk about the Old Testament first in this first half, is what the entire Old Testament is really about. It's about a big cycle where different people at different times and different places go through this same exact cycle over and over and over and over and over again. And it's what I like to call the hope cycle. The hope cycle where people in the Old Testament, you find them where they, they find hope in something, and they find hope in a source, get this, this is very important, they find hope in a source that isn't God, and every time you put your hope in a source that isn't uh, the creator of all things, and isn't the God of the universe, every time you put your hope in something like that, it always leads to sin. And you see in the Old Testament, they put their hope in something, and then they're, they're led into sin, and then sin, get this, sin always, 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 write it down 100% of the time, sin always leads to brokenness. And so you got people in the Old Testament over and over and over again where they put their hope in X, and then it leads them to sin, and then that sin always leads them to brokenness. Over and over and over again, you find this throughout the whole Old Testament. 
In fact, what I would like to do is, is I want to try to give you this, this cycle. And if you're, you know, if you're putting it on a piece of paper, you know, you got hope, sin, brokenness. And it's just this big cycle that goes over and over and over again. And, and I'd like to give you some handlebars that when you're reading the Old Testament, if you will look through this lens, if you will look through uh, this cycle, you will start to see some of the very similar things that happen not only in the Old Testament, not only in their lives, but get this, in your life as well. See, the Old Testament is full of narratives that we can learn from so that we don't repeat the same bad decisions and the same bad mistakes that they repeated. It's so important for us today, for us honestly to just fall in love with the Bible, where we can actually read the Bible. And I can promise you this, that if you will get immersed in the Word of God, that there will be some things that God will expose to you and show you that will prevent you from having a lot of brokenness in your life. And so here's, here's what I'd like to do, is I'd like to just go through Scripture and go through some stories where it shows hope, sin, brokenness. Adam and Eve, the very, very beginning. Like, in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, and, like, he created the universe, and all those things. Adam and Eve, though, listen, Adam and Eve, they decided that they were going to place their hope in something other than God. What did they place their hope in? They placed their hope in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so what they wanted is they thought that their hope could be found in gaining more wisdom for themselves. And that hope that they placed in something other than God ultimately led them to sin. And what did that sin ultimately lead to? It always leads to brokenness. And it led to brokenness in their life, in their family, where Cain and Abel, where Cain literally killed Abel, their sons, because of the sin that led to brokenness. It's not just Adam and Eve, though. It also goes down to through the ages down to Noah. You know the story, Noah's Ark, right? Like it's, it's a great story. We, for whatever reason, we paint it on like Sunday school classrooms. I don't know if you were in that Sunday school classroom back in the day, but it's like painted on the, the wall, right? But what they don't show is they don't show the thousands of people that are in the water, like literally drowning. And they just show the, the cute little animals. Like this was not like a little nursery rhyme. And, and Noah, uh, Noah's Ark, like when Noah gets on the boat, God, God has come to this point where he's saying, man, there is no one righteous in all the earth except for Noah. And he says that he's going to, he's going to save Noah. Listen to me, here's the fact. The fact of the matter is that the people of earth found their hope in something other than God. It led them to sin and ultimately it led them to brokenness. Noah, even Noah, man. <laughs> Noah, like he gets on the ark and you know, God has chosen him and his family to survive, to create, you know, to go and populate and increase and multiply. And Noah, the first thing your boy Noah does when he gets off the boat, God has saved him. He gets off the boat. The first thing this dude does is he goes and he plants a garden so that he can make, uh, so he can make wine so he can get drunk. So Noah finds his hope not in what God did for him and not what God could do for him moving forward, but Noah decides to find his hope in what the earth could give him and what the the alcohol could give him and what getting drunk could give him, which ultimately led him to sin where he slept with some of his kids. That led to brokenness in their entire family and then they're spread out across again. That ultimately led, get this, we're going through the whole Old Testament really fast, okay? Then that led to down through the ages, this dude named Nimrod. Nimrod. And Nimrod, he does exactly opposite of what God told Noah and his family to do. God told Noah and his family, increase and multiply. Go scatter across the nations, increase and multiply, and repopulate the earth, okay? Like, they had to go do all the things that do that, okay? And so they're going to do that, but then Nimrod shows up, and Nimrod decides that he doesn't want to do what God wanted him to do. Instead, Nimrod, instead of scattering, he wants to gather people. And so he gathers people together and he leads this really like an insurrection where they start to build what we call the Tower of Babel. Now, the Tower of Babel was Nimrod's uh, effort at bringing all the people of earth together, but not for the glory of God, but for the glory of man. 
Not to hope in God and say, God, we're going to do this because you've made us creative beings and so we're going to be creative for you. No, they did it to put hope in what they could do in and of themselves. Like, does that sound like anybody? So many of us, we go through life and we put all of our hope in the the job that we can get. We put all of our hope into how we can handle relationships and we leave God out of it. And then at the end of the day, we might say, hey, God, can you stamp your, your stamp of approval on this real quick? And Nimrod is doing the same thing. He's got his hope there, which led to sin, which led to brokenness, which God broke up the Tower of Babel. He scattered them among the the earth. And they they actually, here's the really, really cool thing about this story is that when they scattered, when they scattered, the reason they scattered is because God, uh, God confused them and gave different languages to different people so they could no longer communicate to one another. And so then they start to, to scatter apart And then after the Tower of Babel, Abraham, Father Abraham, have many sons. Many sons have Father Abraham. And he shows up, right? And he comes out. And Abraham, Abraham is given a promise by God. And more than a promise, God God has made a covenant. Get this, God has made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I promise that you're going to have descendants that outnumber the, the stars in the sky. Abraham, I'm going, to, I'm going to send a seed through your lineage that's going to be the promised, not just the promised lineage, but really like the promised man, which was speaking towards Jesus ultimately. And he, he promises to Abraham, he makes this covenant, and God goes so far, this is so, this is so crazy, God goes so far to say uh, along the lines of, if I don't come through on my promise, may it be back on me and not be on anyone else, but be back on me. I will take, I will take responsibility if this does not happen in your life. Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob, here's the funny thing about Jacob, Jacob came out of the womb like as the cheater. Jacob came out, and Jacob, when he was of age, he ended up trying to get his birthright, get the birthright of his brother Esau from him. And I don't know if y'all have ever read this story or not, but like Esau is just like the dumbest dude ever. He shows up, and Esau is really famished and hungry, comes in from uh, from hunting, and he looks like Devin coming in from hunting, you know, and, and he, wants a, he, he wants something to eat. And so Jacob says, hey, I'll sell you my, your, uh, this bowl of soup if you'll give me your birthright. And Esau's like, uh, okay, <laughs> you know, takes it. And, and Jacob ultimately, get this, guys, Jacob ultimately cheated his brother out of what was his in order to get what he selfishly wanted. Jacob found his hope not in God and what God could do through him, whether he was firstborn or secondborn. Jacob found his hope in what he could do in grasping and grabbing for something that wasn't quite his. And so Jacob found his hope in something wrong, which ultimately led to sin, which ultimately led to brokenness in their family, where Jacob was literally running for his life for his entire life because he was afraid that Esau was going to kill him. Hope, sin, brokenness. After Jacob, you skip down a little bit and you come to this dude named Moses. We know Moses, Moses and the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel. And who's seen the the movie The Prince of Egypt? Oh yeah, that's a jam right there, okay. So, So Moses shows up on the scene and Moses is raised by Egyptians and he, he ends up leaving there. And he, he comes back to Egypt, and God is using him to deliver the children of Israel. And what I find so interesting is that the children of Israel, as soon as they leave Egypt, their focus shifts from being on God to shifting their hope and their focus and everything they have, not on God, but they shift it back on what Moses could do for them, what Egypt could have done for them, and what they ultimately could do for themselves, which always, 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 when you put your hope in the wrong source, it always leads to sin. And you find the children of Israel, they're, they're, they're finding themselves in sin where they're literally practicing idolatry and they're sinning and then that leads them to brokenness and they're wandering through the deserts for 40 years and they're, they're looking around like, God, why would, you do this to, why would you do this to us? But honestly, it's because they put their hope in the wrong thing. It always starts hope, then sin, and then brokenness. Then in the middle of all this, get this, 
Then something big happens is uh, God, God sends Moses up on Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and he meets with God. And God gives him the Ten Commandments. And he comes back down and he shows the children of Israel, hey, here's the Ten Commandments. And, you know, this is like the nation building phase for, for God. Like he's, he's you got to have some guidelines. You got to have like, this is how we do it here. This is, this is the law here. And so he simplifies it down to Ten Commandments. And Moses brings those down. And we think, man, hey, that's great. We got the Ten Commandments. Like, here we go. Not so fast. <laughs> Because the Ten Commandments, what they did is, uh, with the Ten Commandments, is what some of us do. Is they put their hope in the law instead of putting their hope in the God of the law. How many of us put our hope in the church? How many of us put our hope in what, what we do for God instead of putting our hope in God? And the children of Israel, they, they put all of their hope in what the Ten Commandments are instead of putting their hope in the God of the Ten Commandments. And that ultimately leads them to sin. You know why that really led them to sin? Because the law, uh, Paul tells us in the New Testament, the law just exposes the sin that's already in your heart. It gives it a name. <laughs> so before they didn't know what adultery was, but man, they put it on the Ten Commandments. Like, oh man, I am I messed up. The law led them to sin, which ultimately led them to brokenness again. Then you got your boy, King David. This dude. What a guy. I mean, King David. Like, he was, he was like top of the line. Like, he's like the LeBron James of kings, okay? He is, he is the goat of kings. And King David shows up. Yeah, LeBron is the goat. All right, at me. Um... <laughs> he shows up, and he, he shows up as a shepherd boy, right? You know the story. He shows up as a shepherd boy. He's got his sling, his stones. Bat hits up. Uh, Goliath goes over there. And so many of us, like this is a different story for a different day, but so many of us stop there where King David kills Goliath uh, with a stone. No, nah, man, that, that man went and took the sword and cut that dude's head off. Like, let's go. You know, Old Testament is cool. And so <laughs> cuts that dude's head off. <laughs> and... Then he's anointed king, and King David comes in, and, and people are looking to him as the greatest king of Israel. And he started off as like, uh, as like messianic hope in him. And when I say that messianic, I mean like the one that is to come to deliver the children of Israel and to deliver on the promise that God made. Because God, just like he made a promise to Abraham that through his lineage would come a savior, he also made the promise to David and said a messianic king of Israel, the king of the Jews, will come through your line, David. There will be a son that comes through your line that will be the greatest king, that will be the Messiah, will be the one that we look to. But, but David, this cat, this guy decides, man, like regardless of what God is doing in his life, he decides to move his hope. Because remember, Scripture tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. But it only takes one little movement of your hope and where you put your hope to change that. He took his hope from his source in God to changing his hope in the source of what he could get as king. And so David had a lot of lust in his heart, and he's lusting after this chick Bathsheba, and she's on the roof, and he's watching her bathe, and it's super creepy story in Scripture, and, and it's happening. And David is king, and he wants, he wants to sleep with her so bad that he sends people to go get her and bring her back. And so she comes back to his house. She's married. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. And then David... And Instead of confessing and saying, man, I have really screwed up here. I'm sorry, like, Lord, forgive me. Instead of doing that, what David does is he says, hey, I want you to send her husband to the front of the lines in the war, and I want to make sure that he gets killed. And so not only has David put his hope in the wrong thing, but his sin has led him to adultery, and then his sin led him to murder. And then ultimately that led to brokenness in his family. If you read David's family, like it's some cray-cray stuff. Like they, they are messed up. They got one of his kids is is raping one of his daughters, one of the, the boys is raping one of the girls, and then another uh, brother is trying to kill the one that raped his sister. And you got all kinds of stuff that's happening in David's family because he put his hope in the wrong thing. 
Hope leads to sin, leads to brokenness. So why, why am I telling you all of this? Why, why am I walking through the Old Testament in this way and just hitting some of the big stories? We're going to go through every single book of the Bible in the second half, but I want to hit some of these big stories and let you know that your hope leads to, it can lead to sin, which always leads to brokenness. So, so why am I telling you this? It's because the same exact thing happens to every single one of us in this place. The same exact thing happens when we find our hope in our finances, when we find our hope in our comfort of we can make the payments, when we, we've got the, the money to, to meet the bills, when we find our hope in our marriage, when we find our hope in our good deeds, when we find our hope in our relationships, if we find our hope in our career path, if we find our hope in our kids and living vicariously through our kids, or we find our hope in our education and how we can study better and make better grades, or we find our hope in our sorority or our fraternity, when we find our hope in anything short of Jesus Christ, it's going to let us down and come up short. Every single time. But here's the reality is every time you or I find our hope in some other source other than Jesus, it always, it doesn't, it doesn't say there, it always leads to sin. It can't help but lead to sin. And the byproduct of sin is always brokenness. And this, this hope, sin, brokenness is the story of the Bible. It's the story of the Bible. That before Jesus came, there was a cycle you find throughout so many different narratives of hope, of sin, of brokenness. And, and you find throughout these stories, you have times where Moses was following God closely. You have times where Abraham placed faith in what God would do in the future, that there would be a coming Savior. You have times where Elijah is sent by God as a prophet to, to come and tell people. You have times of Elisha being sent by God as a prophet to tell people. But ultimately, you always find people what? Falling short of the glory of God and placing their hope in something other than him. It's almost... <laughs> It's almost as if it's human nature. And it's exactly what God watched for thousands of years. Stepping in with prophets and priests and kings to try to redirect the people, try to redirect his people's hopes off of themselves, off of their selfishness, off of their sins, and redirect their hope back to, to Yahweh, redirect their hope back to God, redirect their hope back on what he was going to do. Unfortunately, no matter how good some people would be, they would never be good enough. No matter how good you are, no matter how good you act, no matter how many good deeds you do, it always leads us back where we're just not quite good enough. The story of the Old Testament is not just the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Joshua. The story of the Old Testament is the story of you and the story of me. It's the story of normal people looking for hope. It's the story of people that don't have it together looking for hope. It's the story of, of normal messed up people trying to find a better hope to place their faith in, to place their hope in. And when you see Noah and when you see Moses and Joshua and Joseph and Elijah and all these amazing people used by God, you have to remember that they were just normal people just like you. And just like they went through the cycle of hope, going hope in the wrong thing to sin that led to brokenness, if we're not careful, we can do the same exact thing. See, they were ultimately looking for somewhere to place their hope that was bigger than just themselves, somewhere that what we now call someone who is Jesus. But... That's the New Testament. And that is coming after the halftime show. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful for your word. God, we're so grateful for what you're doing here at Heart and Soul. 
And God, we pray right now that as we move into this time of worship, God, as we move into this time of surrender to you, God, help us to reflect on what we are hoping in that may not be you. God, if it's our relationships, if it's our finances, if it's our, our family, if it's anything other than Jesus, God, would you help us to shift our focus back on you? Lord, if we're in the middle of sinfulness right now, God, would you help us to turn away from our sin? And would you help us to turn our life? Would you help us to turn our ways over to you? God, would you bless this time of worship? We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, come on, heart and soul, everybody on your feet. Thank you for joining us for our Super Bowl Sunday Sprint Through the Bible. Come on, just put your hands together. If you're happy to be here, just lift up a praise to the Lord with us. Just one word. In just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. In just one word, the darkness has to retreat Just one touch And just one touch I feel the presence of heaven And just one touch My eyes are open to see My heart can't help Come on, every voice lift it There's nothing that I can't do There's not a mountain that he Nothing that our God can't do. Come on, every voice lifted. In just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. It just takes a word. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Come on, he's reviving dreams in this place. He's reviving dreams. In just one touch, I feel the power of him. Open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall. Come on, everybody, hands together. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all the grief. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. No power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all the green. There's no power. Like Come on, the every voice lift and sing it out. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all the green. There's no power. There's nothing that I can't Come on. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing, there's nothing that Jesus can't do. There's nothing that I can't can't There's not a prison wall He can't break. Oh, praise the name. 
Yeah, come on, we're going to get crazy in this place today. We're going to really lift up the Lord on this next song. Come on, let's give it all we got.
Wow, Johnny, what a half. That halftime show was... Oh, man, Heart and Soul Worship never fails to just blow do. it out of the water. They never do. Absolutely. So what do you think of the first half of the Bible? It's very old, and it was good. It was long. It was good. That's a pretty quick trip right through the Old Testament. It was, I got, yeah. Get something out of it? All right, great. Let's, uh, let's get ready to get rolling and get into the New Testament. It's a, it's a newie, because it's the New Testament. <laughs> this is good. why we have the concussion protocol in the NFL. What? Nothing, nothing. You're fine, you're fine. This ear got let's just, let's just let's, ear got let's, let's toss it over once again to do Pastor it. Austin. Let's do it. Man. Hey, can we give it up for that halftime show? How was that? Man, that was, that was, uh, what do kids say these days? That was pop, bopping, bopping? Is that, is that what we say? <laughs> the kids. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, so, so uh, now we're moving into the New Testament, all right? And like Johnny said, it's the Newey, okay? The New Testament, and uh, after the events of the Old Testament, actually, there, there's a, a gap of about 400 years. I don't know if you knew this or not, but there's a gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament of about 400 years of silence. God isn't speaking. He's not sending prophets. There's no more, like, books of the Bible being written. There's, there's no more communication in that. And, and if we're really honest, like, if I'm in the Old Testament, right, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Jewish person in the Old Testament, and I'm trying to follow God, like, that 400 years, that, is, that silence is, is almost deafening, isn't it? it it's, it? it's crazy to think that for 400 years there was nothing spoken. And then onto the stage of humanity comes a whisper in the form of the king of the Jews. In, in the form of what many believe will be and is the Messiah. Now the, the story of the Bible starts to shift, right? It starts to shift from, uh, from the Old Testament and they were having hope in what would happen in the future to now there is a hope in the now and the hope's name is Jesus. Now the saints of old, they, they were searching for Messiah to come, but now Jesus has come, and now we as believers, we as a church, we don't look forward to what God is going to do. Instead, we look back and say, God has been so good. We are so grateful for what he's already done. And in the Old Testament, we see that God has set up the covenant between himself and Abraham, he set up the covenant between himself and David. And now in Jesus, we get to see the fulfillment of that promise. Because if God is nothing else, let me tell you today that God is a promise keeper. That what God says, God does. If God promises it, you can bet, your, you bet the bank, you can bet everything you've got that God will see it through. And so then we start to shift through the New Testament. you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you're new to Christianity and you started reading through those, I heard a guy that gave his life to Christ, and then he started reading through the Gospels, is what we call Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And they're just stories about Jesus' life. And he said that he was reading through, and he's like, man, I didn't realize that like, Jesus was getting crucified four different times. Like That's not what's happening there. It's just a story from different perspectives four times. And so Jesus' life is found in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then in Acts, we get to see the aftermath of Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. And the same, the same guy, Luke, who wrote Luke, also wrote Acts. And if you read those back to back, you can see a lot of the similar uh, stylistic mannerisms that he has there. And, and Luke is getting into like the nitty gritty details. And Luke is going through because Luke, Luke was actually a doctor. And so he was like very, very uh, detail focused and he's walking through and then after acts we get all of the epistles everything that ends with ans right all the ans's those are written to churches and essentially the rest of the new testament is an application of jesus's life jesus came jesus lived 
Jesus gave commandments. He said to, to love one another as I have loved you. And then Paul and the writers of the rest of the New Testament, they take the life of Jesus, they take the teachings of Jesus, and they apply it to your life. And that's what happens in the rest of the New Testament. But one of the most fascinating, fascinating passages of Scripture in all of the New Testament is found in Luke chapter 24. And in Luke chapter 24, this is after Jesus' death. This is after Jesus' resurrection. And we, we come into this story in Luke 24, starting in verse 13, if you've got your Bible, starting in verse 13 there. We come into this story, and we see these two, these two guys that are walking down the road to Emmaus. And, and these, guys, <coughs> these guys are walking down the road, and they're feeling defeated because they thought that Jesus was the Messiah, but Jesus had just died. And so all of their hope, everything that they placed their hope in, get this, they placed their hope in Jesus, but now Jesus is dead. And when Jesus died, they thought that everything was over. They thought that everything was for naught. They thought that everything was, was over with him being the Messiah. And so they start to leave Jerusalem. And then this other guy rolls up and he says, hey, what, why are you guys so downcast? And they look back at him and they're like, man, you must be the only person in this entire region that doesn't know the events that have transpired here over the last several days that the, the, the man named Jesus, who we thought was a prophet, who we thought was going to be the Messiah, that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, he was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, but the chief priests put him to death. They said we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, they said, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And then the man that they met on the road to Emmaus looks up at them and he says this, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, get this, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. And later on in Luke 24, we get to see that this man that's walking down the road that meets these two guys on their way to Emmaus, he was none other than the resurrected Jesus himself. And he's telling them, he's walking through scripture, he's walking through the Old Testament, he's saying, look, you thought that it was about Noah's Ark. You thought that it was about the Red Sea parting. You thought that it was about Jacob. And you thought that it was about Abraham. And you thought that it was about this, that, or the other. But Jesus was there to tell them that it wasn't about those things. But really it was about the Redeemer who lives. It was about the Savior to come. It was about the Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords that would show up. That would die on the cross. And not just die on the cross. But he would die on the cross and he would take on the sins of the world. All of the hope that the Old Testament put their hope in all the wrong sources and all of their sin, and all of their brokenness, Jesus would get up on the cross, and he would take the hope, and he would take the sin, and he would take the brokenness of all mankind. And then Jesus would, would die, and he would come back to life on the third day. And the amazing thing about this story is that Jesus would leave the sins, he would leave the brokenness, he would leave the hope and the wrong things in the tomb. He would leave your shame, your guilt, your regret, your sin, everything you've ever gone through. He would leave it in the tomb and he would walk out victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he would have the keys to hand to you. That is what Jesus did, but this is what Jesus told them. Jesus looked at them and he walked through the Old Testament. And if we're sprinting through the Bible, like we said we would, if we're sprinting through the Bible, I'd like to go through every book of the Bible and show you exactly where I believe Jesus is residing in those books. I think that Jesus is, is in a lot more places than just what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share in just a moment. But man, I believe today 
that there's some people in the house that you need to hear where Jesus was in the past because you don't believe that he can be in your future. I'm here to tell somebody today that no matter what you've done, what you've gone through, whatever kind of death to your marriage, death to your finances, death to your school, death to your relationships, whatever kind of death you've experienced in your life, our God specializes in resurrection. This is what he said. This is what the story of the Bible is really about. In Genesis, in Genesis, He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the temple to meet with God. In Numbers, he's the ever-present pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. He is your great and powerful deliverer. In Deuteronomy, he's the coming prophet that's greater than Moses He's greater than the angels. He's greater than everything that you can find. In Joshua, he's the scarlet thread on Rahab's house to lead a broken people to a perfect Savior. In Judges, he is the perfect judge. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, he's the shepherd king rushing out to face your fears, to face your giants, and to abolish everything that's come into your life. In 1st and 2nd Kings, he is the promise keeper, and he is the restorer of the kingdom of Israel. In 1st and 2nd Chronicles, he is the reigning king, and he is the restorer of all of the kingdom. In Ezra, he is the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, He is the rebuilder of the broken walls. In Esther, he's the advocate risking everything in order to restore order to your life. In Job, he is my redeemer who lives today. In Psalms, he is the Lord, your shepherd. In Proverbs, he is your wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is your true satisfaction. And he is the meaning and all of your meaningless. In the Song of Solomon, he is the beautiful bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the everlasting Father, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, who was wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your disease. In Jeremiah, he is the righteous branch of Israel. In Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the Son of Man, bringing healing to all the nations. In Daniel, He is the fourth man in the furnace. In Hosea, in Hosea, he is the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the one who restores everything that was lost. In Amos, he is the burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is the mighty judge of all the earth. In Jonah, he's the prophet cast out in the storm so that you ain't got to go out into the storm. In Jonah, that's what he is. In Jonah, he is the prophet. He is the prophet. But in Micah, in Micah, he is our everlasting king. He is our ruler. He is our peace. In Nahum, he is the greatest avenger. In Habakkuk, he's the reason to rejoice. Even when all else has been lost in your life, he has still been good to somebody in this house. In Zephaniah, he is the Lord who is mighty to save. In Haggai, he's the cleansing fountain and the Lord of hosts. In Zechariah, he is the fountain of cleansing and the fierce sun for your transgressions. In Malachi, he is the sun of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Oh, but in Matthew, in Matthew, he is the promised Messiah. In Mark, he is the faithful servant. In Luke, he is the friend of sinners. In John, he is the very son of God. Oh, but in Acts, it ain't over. In Acts, he is the ascended Lord who is proclaiming salvation to every nation, to every tongue, to every ethnicity, to every race. He is the Lord of all. In Romans, he is the justifier of your faith. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he is your righteousness from the curse of all things evil. In Galatians, he is the redeemer from the curse of the sin that has a strangle on your life. In Ephesians, 
He is the head of the church and your righteousness. In Philippians, in Philippians, he is the all-sufficient Christ and that he brings all contentment to your life. In Colossians, he is the fullness of all and the firstborn of all creation. In First and Second Thessalonians, he is the Lord coming down from heaven to judge with blazing fire. In First and Second Timothy, he is your mediator between God and his perfection and man and your sinfulness. He is your mediator. In Titus, he is the blessed hope. He is your blessed assurance. In Philemon, he is the one who paid your debt. In Hebrews, he is your great high priest. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than anything and everything in your life. He is the greatest. In James, he is your wisdom. And he is the sovereign Lord over all creation. In First and Second Peter, he is the chief shepherd and cornerstone rejected by men so that you can be accepted by God. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he's the advocate, he's the word of life, and the one true God in Jude, he's the Lord coming with countless thousands, coming back for you in Revelation. He is the Alpha, he is the Omega, he is the beginning, he is the end, he is your King of Kings, he is your Lord of Lords, and he is here today in this place. I'm here to tell somebody, that if you got some death in your life, if your marriage looks dead, if your finances look dead, whatever looks dead, our God specializes in resurrection. And so on the authority of the Word of God, we say, Let, let, try to the Word of the Lord. Let, let, try to the Lord. 